Can students hear us? Yeah, I think so. Welcome to ITEP, but if you are on here as a prospective student, can you uh, either raise your hand? Oh, great, you can hear. So we are broadcasting. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> you watched us do a bunch of technical stuff. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome, everyone. I know we have a bunch more people who are planning on being here, uh, so we'll just get started. I'm Cynthia Miller Idris. I'm the director of the ITEP program. I'm an associate professor here of education and of sociology, um, and I work on uh, my research is on extremism. Uh, and working class youth, primarily in Europe, and I also work on the internationalization of the research university. Um, I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves, and then we'll explain a little bit about the format. We are also waiting for one other faculty member, Christian Bracho, uh, to arrive from a class. Uh, so, Elizabeth, you're right on my left uh, on the screen, sure. so I'll have you start. <laughs> Hi, hope everyone can hear me. I'm Elizabeth Worden. I'm another faculty member here in the International Education Training Program. I'm a Return Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and my research looks at how teachers teach controversial subjects after political or social transition. I looked at this in the former Soviet Union, and now I have a new project underway in Northern Ireland. Great. Sorry for my technical issues here as my camera falls into my tissue box. Okay. I'm here in Jody. <laughs> Good morning, uh, sorry, good afternoon. My name is Jody Dixon. I'm the current graduate assistant for um, the ITEP program. So many, many of you may be in contact with me um, very regularly. I'm also a second year student. I'll be graduating in May and also an international student. And I work very closely with all the members of faculty here as well as Ophira, our program um, coordinator. Hi, that's me. I'm Afira, the pro ITEP program coordinator. I've been in email contact with several of you as well, and uh, I'm so glad you're interested in our program. And uh, we have some fabulous faculty and uh, prospective uh, current students for you to ask questions of today. Emily? Hi, I'm one of the current students. Uh, my name is Emily Valerga. I'm in my last semester of ITEP, just like Jody. Um, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions today. Great. And Amelia, who's showing up as Val on the uh, screen, but <laughs> is actually Amelia Tsang, one of our faculty members. Hi, everyone. Um, as, as Cynthia just said, I'm not Val. I'm actually Amelia Tsang. I'm one of the ITEP faculty members. Um, I'm also a bilingual education faculty and program director. So my research lies in language, um, identity, and multilingualism immigration, that kind of thing. So really that perspective on language diversity is what I bring to um, to the classes I'm teaching in ITEP, sort of language diversity and education and how those things interact. Great. Um, well, thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. Uh, we generally try to keep our formal remarks uh, during these open houses very short and make it very um, student and prospective student driven. So please think of questions, shoot those questions out into the chat section as you have them. Uh, and we will try to make this as relevant and um, uh, to your interest as we can. So um, that said, I'll say a couple of things. We are um, right in the midst of admission season. We know that's why you're on the call. Probably you have lots of questions about how decisions get made, when decisions get made, how funding happens. Um, so we'll try to say a little bit about that. But first, I want to say a little bit about the program itself. Um, uh, and I should say, you know, before I came to AU, this is my third year, I spent 10 years uh, at NYU, I was the director of their program, so I know that program very well. Um, we also know some of the other programs in the field quite well, um, either as students or as faculty or as colleagues of, of scholars there, so we can talk a little bit about how we're different um, from those other programs. Um, we are uh, the only program in the country or in the world really to have the, the word training in our title. We, that, that reflects a particular niche that we have in the field, um, and, uh, which is a niche that a lot of our alumni um, uh, tend to work in, which is the training field. So working with adult learners, training of trainers, so our recent alumni are you know, directors of training for the Peace Corps, working in the Foreign Service, working in the State Department. Christian's here, he's going to pull up a chair. Um, working in uh, contexts where they are training um, teachers, training um, teachers in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, 
um, and doing other kinds of training. Here's Christian, and he'll introduce himself in a minute. Um, you're just going to have to nestle in close I will, here. I will, I will, I <laughs> will. Um, and, uh, uh, but we have a very structured program. We have a very deep curriculum, several different pillars of curriculum. So you do research methods over two semesters. We do, you can do training over two semesters and then also have electives. Uh, you also have sequences in things like international exchange. There are lots of development electives to take as well. So, um, so I'll answer specific questions about the coursework, but that's just to say that we have a more structured and intentionally structured program, um, more structured than most, and that came as a result of a three-year process um, involving students and alumni and faculty and people in the field. Um, uh, asking what their needs were and what the needs were for um, folks entering the field. And so we significantly revamped the curriculum. We took more than a year to do it. And then uh, this is the first year, the first cohort right now that's in that new curricular plan. Uh, and so far, all reports are great. Um, we're running more electives than ever. And the program is growing faster than ever. Our applications right now are up 300% compared to last year. It's, it's very intense. Um, very fun time for us to see this kind of interest. We're excited by it. And um, yeah, we have two new faculty. I mean, we are just growing by leaps and bounds. So um, with that said, uh, maybe we can, Elizabeth, do you want to add anything, Amelia, anything about how the program works? Do we have questions coming in? And if not, um, maybe Christian can introduce himself really fast. Sure. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Christian Bracho. I just joined the faculty last fall. I've taught courses on uh, educational policy in the Global South, where we look at the ways that educational policy is developed in uh, regions like Latin America, Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I also taught a course on the international education, the Comparative International Education Survey course. This semester I'm teaching a course on educational equity in the global context. So we're looking at equity both domestically and uh, internationally. And I'm also teaching a course called Teacher Activism and Global Change, and I'm looking at the ways that teachers are involved in social movements and social change in different historical and contemporary contexts. Um, so I'm really excited to be part of the staff and the faculty here, and I hope that you'll be considering joining us. Maybe you say one thing about your research, just like a sentence sure. what your area is so students know. Yeah, so my research is primarily focused on teachers and teacher training, uh, the way that teachers get involved in social movements. I just finished my dissertation in 2015, and I looked at teachers' movements in southern Mexico, where I spent some time doing interviews, ethnographic observations, and some archival uh, work as well, looking at the history of teachers' movements in Mexico. OK, good. Um, maybe I could turn to Emily and Jody while we're waiting. Unless, I think, Ophira, you can see the questions, but I can't see the questions, right? So yes. do you want to flag if questions come in? I'll let you know. And please um, go ahead and, and type in your questions as you have them. Um, and we can answer them, um, both faculty and students can answer your questions. And this hour is really for you to ask all those questions you have, whether it's about the application process, the courses, the faculty. Um, Amelia and Elizabeth can talk to you about the courses they're teaching this spring, about um, the kind of international travel um, options that are available, uh, research, um, training, uh, what training niche means. So please go ahead and type in your questions and we'll answer those for you. But maybe Emily and Jody can say something from the perspective of current students about the program, how you chose it, how you afford to live here, um, <laughs> anything that you know is relevant for people trying to make a decision about where to apply, where to go, why to get a master's degree in this field at all, that kind of thing. Emily, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Okay. Um, that's a lot of questions. Um, I chose the ITEP program um, because I was very interested in continuing to develop my international education focus. And I chose ITEP over any of the other programs that I found because, as you can see, the faculty in our program are phenomenal. Um, they're all here ready to talk to you and answer your questions. They want you to come be a part of ITEP. And the, staff, and the students are the same way. Um, it's very much a cohort. We're all here to support each other. Um, and there is always the opportunity to work while you're in class. So you can go from being a full-time student to a part-time student um, throughout every semester based on sort of what you're doing, how your work life is panning out. Um, 
which is why I chose the program, because when I emailed um, the graduate assistant at the time and asked her, hey, do students generally work? She gave me a whole list of resources, who I should talk to, and the kinds of jobs that students generally have. When I did the same for other programs, I was not given the same amount of information, and so I chose ITEP, <laughs> because I found that our program is very supportive and very much um, friendly and willing to answer all questions. Okay. Just to piggyback off um, Emily, uh, the, the my experience was very similar in terms of support. I think we dealt with the same the same graduate assistant at the time. Uh, as an international student, it was very difficult for me. I think a little bit more challenging to one apply from overseas and to do so in a country that was not my own. Um, and I found that during my my research, one this program, well, American University and this program actually came highly recommended from the, the, American, the American consulate in my home country. And so when I set my sights on the program, I was like, one, it's going to be competitive if it's coming straight from the embassy. But at the same time, I knew that if, you know, the embassy was recommending it, then it must, it, it must have left a mark on somebody somewhere. And coming, having decided to come here, I think that even in Washington, D.C., and among my peers in other universities who are in similar programs, uh, I find that it's the field of international ed is not so it's not as competitive. It's more co collaborative. But I think that ITEP in itself one comes with a very high level of support. I, I think that for me is the most th that that was a selling factor for me coming from the grad assistant and then later on coming from Cynthia who had just become director at the at the time. Uh, it definitely was what for me helped me choose the program. And I mean, having to choose a program in Washington, D.C., which is way by leaps and bounds more expensive than in another country, um, really does it, even support for trying to find a place to live came from from people in this program. So I think for me, definitely the support and now being here, the, the level of support academically and professionally is definitely what is a winner in terms of this program for me. And just to touch on how complicated the application process was for Jody, um, who is originally from Jamaica, but was living in Japan sort of five years during the JET program. And so we did some uh, early morning Skype calls. Yes. A couple of times. <laughs> that 12 hour difference. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Certain time of year is 14 hours, right? As I, I, I was up at 5 in the morning on a call with Japan last week, so um, as I know, it was 14 hours ahead, so it depends on the time of year and also where you are in Japan. But um, Elizabeth, do you want to add anything? You are our you know, most uh, long-term faculty member in the program. You've been here almost a decade, right? Yes, almost a decade. Good point. So I joined AU in 2007 and was tenured in 2014, so two years ago, and um, I love ITAP for, I don't want to say that because I work here, um, but just echoing what Emily and Jody alluded to, it's a really cozy program. All of the students seem to become really good friends. Um, they do fun things together, whether it's just happy hours or a couple years ago students got together and developed a study abroad program. We have students that have led alternative breaks together. Um, I think students often like share our housemates. And it's just a really cozy, nice program. Everyone is friendly, collaborative. Um, i trying to think what else to say. It's great being in DC. You know, there's upsides and downsides to that. It's expensive, so you have to be creative and yes. you know, getting roommates or um, you know, some, some students come and start school full-time and then go part-time. But then the upside to D.C. is that it's D.C. There's so much to do. There's so many opportunities just to attend events or internships or um, have internships. I'm trying to think what else I can say. Um, I don't know. I'm waiting to hear from y'all. So why don't you ask us some questions? I can I'll just ask you a couple more things yeah. about the program um, while you're thinking of your questions and tell you that. And, and we can sort of... We, we, uh, I would say there's a cluster of questions that always come, so we can kind of respond to some of those questions, too, with we the assumption that some of you may be holding those questions but just not, not um, ready to type them out. But So uh, we have 54 students in the program right now. 
Uh, 21 of those students are graduating in May, um, and we are hoping to have a cohort of about 30 students in the fall. So it is growing. We're aiming for about 30. We have uh, 27 this year in um, this cohort between the fall and the spring. Um, that's a really good number. Uh, we have um, enough students that we're able to run um, two sections of courses and run one section of electives. So required courses are small. Um, they tend to have uh, 15 to 20 students per class. They're taught by core faculty members with one exception when we need specialized skills. So um, that's something that's really important when you look at other programs. Find out who's teaching their required core courses. Are you being taught primarily by adjuncts who are not really at the university, not available for a question and answer, not available to write letters for you afterward. Um, we try very, very hard to have our core courses taught by core faculty. Um, and who are here by the four of us, and that is almost always the exception except for courses where we need someone to teach a skill that we feel is better, you know, students are going to be served better by somebody else. And so, for example, we have an advanced quantitative methods course um, that teaches kind of quantitative program evaluation skills, and that's taught by uh, 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 someone who is a specialist in that area. Also, our training and design courses are taught by um, specialists who are working in the field right now um, at USAID as, as training and design folks. Um, so uh, we bring in sort of specialized expertise from the field in Washington when we need it, um, but otherwise your core courses and specialized electives are often taught by the four of us by core faculty. Um, and, uh, and then we bring a couple of elective options in every year by specialists also um, working in the field. In, uh, in international education, in education and development, and global education, um, and uh, to the extent that there's student interest in particular regions, like um, we had a course on ed policy in the global south uh, this past fall, which was driven by students. Okay, so questions. All right, so we've got a whole <laughs> flow of them here. Um, one question here is, I'm coming from the West Coast. What is the living cost in DC? Emily? I can answer that. Great. I am also from the West Coast. I came from UC Santa Cruz. Um, I was living in a shared home in Santa Cruz, three blocks from the beach, and it was cheaper than living in DC. So DC is not cheap. <laughs> and there's no ocean right there around the corner. So the cost of living, um, the housing, you have to do your research, but you can do, you can live for under $1,000. I currently have my own room in a really nice house right in Tunneltown for $1,000, everything, in, like, usually when the heating bill goes up this winter, it'll be a little over. But you can do it. It does take some work. You have to be patient. You have to do a ton of research. Um, the only difference is in, I don't know what part of the West Coast you're from, but generally food is a lot cheaper because produce is coming from the West Coast. So on the East Coast and in D.C., in addition to the cost of living in your home, you also have the cost of groceries goes up because all of our produce is imported from elsewhere in the states. We get our oranges from Florida and our avocados from Mexico. Yeah, there are a lot of ways to get free food on campus, which is <laughs> very cool. savvy. Uh, you can you can work through a lot of meals um, by hopping around to all kinds of brown bags and lectures and all kinds of things. Um, the other thing I usually tell students is that you know often students don't want to do this, but there actually are some ways to really sorry about that to really really reduce um, your costs of, of living here. If you're willing to, for example, um, so I live in the neighborhood, sorry, I'm putting this over here where it's going to stay put. Um, so uh, I live in, I also live in Tenley Town right in the neighborhood and um, every fall, every summer there are postings from families who are looking for someone to live in a basement apartment or live in a room in return for helping get the kids ready for school, right? Because it's somebody who works as a lawyer downtown and has to be out early. Like if you're willing to live with a family, do some elder care, um, provide sort of tutoring, language, if you have foreign language skill, right, language instruction, music instruction, soccer, I mean you have more skills than you think. Um, there are lots of families and, and old, older people in the, in the neighborhood and around D.C. Who, are, who have extra rooms, who have small apartments in their houses. Um, and all you have to do is sort of draft up an email and post that on the listserv, say, incoming grad student. And so in my neighborhood, there are a lot of grad students living there in sort of basement apartments or garden apartments. 
um, either in return for rent or in return for some reduced rent for helping out a little bit. And as a grad student where most of your classes are at night, um, you can be really, really flexible if you have uh, you know, a family that has toddlers or something and needs help. Um, and so that can be something some of our students have done. I know a lot of students in the neighborhood do that. Also, I think some students choose to live, uh, you know, not exactly in Tenley Town or right in D.C., but in Maryland, and it's a little, right. some parts of Maryland are cheaper, and they're off the, I think, the red line, so it's yeah. easier to get to campus. So I think a lot of students get creative with, uh, you know, where they choose to live, what neighborhoods, and I think, at, like Emily, a lot of students end up living together. So they might have a temporary thing for a couple of months, maybe a sublet or something like that, yeah. and then they get to know other students, and they end up uh, choosing to live together. And I think that's yeah. actually a really good cost uh, saving. We also are happy to connect our first year students with each other over the summer. We do that every year if we know that students are, I mean, it's not a huge program. That's one of the advantages. We can do that. If you shoot us an email and say, hey, I'm looking for a roommate, um, we can connect. There's a way of connecting at the university with other first year grad students across the university, but also within our own program. So a bunch of our students do live together, um, find housing, or there's second year students who say, right. You know, somebody's graduating and a room opens up, um, and so a lot of our students do that. And Amelia, you lived here as a student before you were a faculty member in Washington, right? So do you have anything to add on the cost of living? Yeah. It's expensive. I know there's a lot more <laughs> questions coming in. There's a lot of questions here about financial aid for international students, merit awards. Right. I'm wondering if we should. Yeah. Sure. So so one more thing, actually, student perspective questions. One is about financial aid. International students do not get financial aid. Um, you are eligible for a merit um, if your application is in by February 1st, and there are, are um, a number of scholarships on the National Scholarship Directory that's on the AU website. The second question for international students is about internships and um, CPT and Jody can uh, answer um, about assistance for that. And maybe okay. let me just add really quickly that right now about 30% of our students receive merit awards. So um, we, are, we have a really good rate of funding students. Those are partial awards, meaning you get some kind of um, tuition discount or work hour or combination of tuition discount and work hours um, that offset the cost. And then, um, and then also some students will eventually, and this is not as relevant for international students, but can work on campus, and then that adds to it. But Jody, um, you are the best person to answer the questions about working and about internships for international students. Okay, in terms of, um, uh, just to add on a little bit more about in terms of merit and graduate assistantships and so on, um, if you're an international student, uh, the work the work um, requirement that goes along with your visa, you'll only be allowed to work for a maximum 20 hours while you're on campus um, throughout the throughout your entire um, time at the university. So for your first academic year, you are limited to 20 hours on campus, except during breaks, with that being spring break, winter break, and summer break. Um, in terms of CPTs and internships, uh, CPT for everybody else listening is uh, curricular practical training. It is not required, but some of our students, including myself, have opted to do it as um, a supplement to our program because you have to do it for academic credit. So if you're considering doing CPT while you're in the ITEC program, it has to be integral to whatever your program of study is. We do offer assistance in terms of being able to connect you with career services or if you are interested in working with a professor and so on outside of your 20 hours on campus, then we can assist in connecting you with those people. However, usually our students like myself have to go out and do the footwork like we would if we were looking for a job um, and ensure that we follow through with doing the correct paperwork in order for the CBT to be approved. Um, so there is no there is no real limit to where you can do your CPT as long as it is approved by the program director and it aligns with your program of study. We have another question here. Um, I am interested in the Peace Corps option and I noticed that the courses are laid out for each semester. How difficult is it to maintain a full-time job? So multiple parts to that question. Um, first of all, for those who have never heard of this, we offer master's international program, which essentially means that you can do your master's degree in international training and education along with a Peace Corps stint um, abroad tw for 27 months. 
So you would first apply um, to ITEP as a master's international student. And once you begin your first semester uh, in ITEP, you would then apply to the Peace Corps. And it's about a nine month uh, process, application process um, for medical checks, all that kind of stuff for them to place you. So the courses on, on the Master's International site of ITEP, uh, I, Master's International page of ITEP website has the courses laid out as a, as a full-time student. The question is, um, how difficult is it to maintain working full-time and being a full-time student? About 50% of our uh, students work full-time and study full-time. Um, but 25 Okay, 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 you need to clarify that. How many, and I think this might be best for Emily and Jody to answer, because full-time student is three courses, right? Yeah. But I think many students who work full-time, that is a lot. They often do two, only two courses. Um, so Jody and Emily, maybe. But 50% of our students are doing three while working full-time. Right. While working full-time? Yeah. 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 It's Sorry. Awesome. Sorry, guys. Yeah, no, no, I know. It is. It is, it is intense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's difficult. Nobody's saying it's not difficult. It is intense. It is, um, you know, you have something has to give, right? And that's usually your social life. And uh, that's where the student board happy hours come in that you let off a little steam. So it can be done, for sure. Um, but 25% of our students who work full time are working full time and they, then they take courses part time. Uh, particularly if you start a new job, um, it's easier to start off with you know lesser courses and then increase um, your course level back up to full time. That's right. That is not an option for the master's international students because you do have to complete right. the coursework before you depart for the Peace Corps. Right. It's, it's much more rigid. So you would be, but you know, half of our students are doing that anyway. So it is, I think it is possible, but you have to be aware that. As as they were saying, as as Afira was saying, it's you know that's it. Like you kind of have room for two really big things in your life, and that's probably it for right now. You're not gonna you know you're gonna drop down on your hobbies, you know other kinds of options for um, times that you spent. You know you're probably not gonna hit the gym as often. Like there's just not gonna be a lot of other space in your life. But but it's a very intense year, and then you would go off to the Peace Corps for 27 months, and then come back and complete that year. Right. So, and keep in mind that you'd only be on campus for approximately 9 to 12 months during your first year of studies, depending upon when you're placed, like if it's over the summer or if it's in the fall. So, for a lot of students, they are working full-time, but it would, um, but it's in a position that they can kind of quickly drop when they need to, if, if that makes sense. Okay, so um, our next question, and please follow up with another question about that if you have. Um, what kind of research assistantships are you expecting to be offering for 2016-27 academic year? So we will have about six to eight research assistant placements um, next year. Uh, those range from, they're mostly about, you know, so these are not these are not research assistantships like a doctoral student research assistantship where you're getting a full package. It's a paid hourly research assistantship. It's, uh, sometimes it comes with tuition remission, but not always. Um, and so you would either be working with one of the ITEP faculty or with um, uh, some of our research and, and what we call graduate assistantships are um, doing a combination of that and, and programmatic support for the program. So Jody's, for example, is 20 hours a week working with ITEP. We have um, students who are placed with other programs like bilingual education, working with Amelia, who is a joint faculty member. Um, so we expect to have about seven to, you know, somewhere around six to eight, around seven of those um, placements available. That's part of the merit funding package. Right, Elizabeth, I'm going to take this one. How flexible is the capstone project for ITAP? Um, is it more of a research paper thesis or can an internship also fulfill that requirement? Great. So for the capstone project, which um, Amelia and I are teaching those sections this semester, we rotate through faculty. Um, it's either research-based or we like to say or project-based. So a research-based project might be something you work on all year, collect interviews, or something you work on for the semester, maybe doing document analysis where you're doing original research, and your your final capstone is a more traditional research paper that we would encourage you to sorry present at. Uh, you know, local uh, local student research conference or the national research conference, or submit it for publication. No one has done that yet, but I'm always, always, always hoping someone will submit one of their capstone papers. And the project-based capstone project, 
might look like a training that you would research, you would develop, you would pilot, and then you would evaluate. Or another project might be developing a manual, a handbook for a study abroad office, if one student's working on that right now, um, or um, like training handbook manual, um, hidden, sorry, I'm Nothing else for a project comes to mind right now. But for the internship, is the internship in itself would not be your capstone. It would be the project that you do within an internship. And so it's an ITEP program, you can take an internship for credit, or I think most students would do it for about three credits, um, or your pro you can do a project within that internship, and that project becomes your capstone. But you would not get internship credit for it. You would take it as your capstone class, um, if that makes sense. So an internship is definitely an option for a capstone, but again, it's that project within what you're doing within the internship. But a really good example of that is for several years um, in a row, Peace Corps offered an internship where students were designing training for um, one of the Peace Corps programs. And so the training that they did within the Peace Corps internship was their capstone, um, not the internship itself. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, what kind of resources are available to graduate students in ITEP to find a job? So many. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, you want to say something right that. now? That's why I chose ITEP because Jody's amazing and she sends out a newsletter every week with at least three to five job options available. Um, she's on top of it. She makes sure to publish it. We have. Um, a current student Facebook page as well that's maintained by our student board, which includes Jody, and they're constantly, and other students as well, are always posting up job opportunities. You have your classmates, many of them are working or interning, so one of my housemates um, currently works at Ahmed East, um, bringing students from generally the Middle East to the U.S. on Fulbrights. And she got the position because one of our classmates started working there, and he's like, oh, there's an internship. You should apply. So she applied, and then a job opened up, and then she took the job. So it's just very much everybody, like I said earlier, is very collaborative. Our program is wonderful for helping you find what you're looking to do. And I know I said earlier DC is really expensive, but I gave up the beach because DC has the network. It has that like career in international education. If you want to really pursue any interest in international education, be it the development side or the study abroad side, DC is absolutely the place to be. So I sacrificed the beach and for that. Jody uh, reminded me we have our uh, ITEP alumni panel and a career panel, and uh, we do uh, networking with the alumni and um, hear not only where they are right now but how they got there. What are the steps they took from their ITEP degree to the State Department or to uh, the nonprofit that they're in, um, in the organizations? And it, it's really great. And on, if you look on the Facebook, American University Facebook page, sorry, American University International Training and Education Program Facebook page, there's a couple internships, jobs, um, conferences, and resources for students at AU that um, we post pretty uh, frequently, a couple times a week. And additionally, um, the student board, uh, there's a question later that we'll answer regarding the student board. We also do plan our own professional development events for, for our students. Uh, recently, we had a one of the career advisors from the American University Career Services Office uh, come and spend a night with us um, to tailor resumes and cover letters specifically for jobs in the international education field. So we do kind of take an initiative as students or to work together and to help our peers um, with their professional development and job searches. Can the current students elaborate a little more on the work opportunities they have found in DC? Ah, <laughs> I definitely can do that, as, especially because as an international student, it's a struggle because of my visa status. Um, and with that being said, it's not it's not usually that I can't find a job. It's that I found the job and I can't work. Um, there is there's no shortage of opportunities here, whether it is that you want to work in development or if you want to work in higher ed there. We have the American University um, Simplicity Career web page that is quite overwhelming because there are so many postings 
uh, on that university webpage regarding jobs and the career services office here is amazing with helping students connect with employers, whether it be for informational interviews and um, and just, you know, getting building your network. I have also found that assignments in ITEP <laughs> have assisted in building my network base. There have been actual assignments that require us to go out and get ourselves known in the field, whether it be by, you know, introducing yourselves, collecting business cards, just networking, because our professors understand how important it is to get out there and network, especially in Washington, DC. So it hasn't been, it hasn't been a real struggle regarding finding job opportunities. It's just a matter of, I guess, putting your cards out there and selling yourself the best way possible. Absolutely. Is it more um, cost effective to live on or off campus? The graduate students do not live on campus. They um, usually live uh, in apartments or houses um, that they've rented and usually with multiple roommates. The more roommates, the cheaper the rent becomes. Uh, do you offer any summer courses? Yes. This summer we are offering um, two core classes. EDU 612, uh, which is Equity and Education in the Global Context, and EDU 642, which is Program Training and Development. Sorry, I said that wrong. Training Program Design, my bad. As well as two Skills Institutes, which are for uh, one credit each. Um, and those are on training courses as well. One is training on the in the online context, and um, the second is inclusion and diversity in training um, and then students can offer take uh, often take courses uh, within the consortium which is the uh, University of Maryland and George Washington uh, yeah George Washington and um, what's the one in Virginia there's George there's George mm -hmm. George Mason George Mason yeah so like, for example one course that students frequently take over the summer would be education and emergencies and that's a course that AU does not offer and the way the consortium courses work is you can only take courses that AU does not offer um, that's how that works um, next question where do your international oh oh students usually do their OPT oh okay that's similar to this that's similar to CPT, but the fact that you can you can work in the U.S. for a year after you graduate means that it, it was really in. It's all about taking the initiative to find an organization that is willing to um, do the paperwork and to us and to assist you with that. So there really is no limit on where you do your OPT. It can be in state, out of state, and so that that leaves you with innumerable possibilities. Hey, uh, great student board question. What kind of social activities do you try to organize for the ITEP students to help them network with one another and other international education organizations? So as I had mentioned before, um, the student board, we do have several activities planned uh, outside of our happy hours or, or professional development events. We tend to do, we tend to attend also other other organizations events so we especially there's a very popular one here in dc the we call them ypi or young professionals in international education we currently have a, an itep alum who is on the board of that organization and so she invites us to all their events and because they encompass the entire dmv area and they have a lot of networking connections most of the individuals there are working in international education organizations we tend to attend a lot of their events, which include things like speed networking, symposiums, and also a bit, few more happy hours, um, pie tastings. They range from just simply entertainment to very, very educational or professional development related events. Elizabeth, do you want to talk about the Washington International Education Consortium and the upcoming student research? Sure. Um, so as you've heard us talk about the consortium, which is American University, GW, Georgetown, University of Maryland, George Mason um, with international education programs. So every year we have a student research conference that rotates. This year we're hosting an AU. And anyone who wants to present can. It's all student presentations. You can present something that you've done for a class, a research project, your capstone. And faculty attend all of the sessions. And it's a really casual, friendly environment to present research. And then we have a great lunch. And you can meet 
you know, students from different programs, youth faculty from different programs across the DC area. So this is a great way to network because these will be your colleagues, not only in the ITEP program, but all the other international education programs in the area will be your colleagues for the next 30 years. So it's nice to know where the research is and, uh, you know, hear what organizations they're working at, too. It's a great way to hear about other places that you may not have already known about. I'm going to jump in for a sec because I need to leave early. So I just wanted to, to say it's been great meeting everybody. Again, I'm not Valerie Ronson. I'm Amelia Thang. Um, and if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me, um, you know, anything you'd like to talk about about what I teach, um, anything like that, I'm happy to take them quickly now or to talk to you over email, Skype, phone, etc. I'm just trying to go through a couple of questions. Thanks, Amelia, for joining us. Sorry uh, that you can't Great. stay, but we know you're off to another meeting, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank you all. It's been great. I hope to see all of you next year. Yeah. <laughs> um, Bye. Question about undergraduate students who um, studied at AU as undergrad, do you get a reduced tuition? No. Unfortunately but, not. We um, uh, don't have, you know, we don't control the tuition policies or how tuition is set. There are a couple of options for undergrads, but if you already graduated, it's those are probably passed. If you're a current undergrad, at AU, you can apply for the BA MA program, in which case some of the credits from, I think 12 credits from your bachelor's degree can count toward the master's degree. Um, but uh, that has to be articulated before you have 90 credits graduated, and it has to be the same. You know, you're basically um, allowed to use, you have to take the same coursework, you're just counting it toward your undergraduate degree. So it sounds like that's probably not what you're talking about. We also can give up to six credits for um, JET program experience for returnees. If, you know, it's, it, uh, it's upon evaluation of how much time you spent there, up to six credits for Peace Corps returnees, um, also for Fulbright teaching assistance abroad. So if you spent time overseas um, in, in, a, uh, in a program that involves not just work overseas, but kind of a participation in a program that was selective, that involves um, kind of has a citizen diplomacy uh, component in addition to its teaching component that you did, um, you can talk to us about it and see if we can petition to have that, uh, have any kind of waived tuition credits. But that's, um, and then the, the third way is to go through the Peace Corps program, which is a significantly reduced tuition uh, through its partnership with the Peace Corps. So um, we're happy, there's a special on February 12th, I think is the date, um, we're hosting another uh, open house specifically on the MI. Um, the, uh, the Ambassador's International Program, which is the Peace Corps, but we're also happy to answer questions about that at another time. But that is, if you're willing to do the Peace Corps and interested in that, that's another way. It's February 10th. February 10th, right? sorry. Yeah, and the Masters International, uh, Masters International Webinar, February 10th at 7 p.m. Uh, you can RSVP um, on that same link that you had seen, and we'll have a Peace Corps recruiter join us to answer any application questions. And uh, field questions. You might be able to answer a question. Uh, it depends on where you live, but can you do without a car in DC? I was going to answer that question actually. Uh, you know, I live in Cal. I grew up in California. I just moved from California. I do miss my car, but I've uh, I've lived in New York City before, and I feel like DC has a great public transit system. The subway, the metro system is, I think, very uh, accessible. Uh, the bus system, I think, is actually really good. It's not that expensive. I feel like so. Uh, I think. If you're used to having a car, you can adjust pretty easily. If you've never lived somewhere without a car, it might be a bit of a transition, but I feel like it's been seamless and I don't, I, you know. Yeah, I ride my bike to campus whenever I can, and uh, there are a lot of uh, faculty who do that, some students do that as well. Um, it depends on where you live and how much you're willing to deal with the hills, because um, there are some hills. <laughs> the AU's on the top of the big hill. Exactly. <laughs> I'll give you a free Uber ride, so just, you know, let me know and I'll text you an Uber, you know. <laughs> Paid parking is worse, so you may as well hit the hills. Yeah, right, exactly. 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 You don't want to deal with the parking. Especially in the winter. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah, really. Um, all right, so another question, somebody who came in a little bit late, if you haven't co if you haven't already covered assistantships, et cetera, um, when do those decisions go out? I've already received the admissions decision, but how do I know if I've received any funding support? Decisions on funding um, are made, so we, because the merit deadline is not until February 1st, we make we uh, make the merit decisions after all the applications are in, so everyone who's eligible to be reviewed um, by making the deadline at that point goes into the pool, and we have a meeting scheduled 
uh, in very early February, we make those decisions as a faculty, we make the recommendations, and then the dean decides on the final awards. Uh, and so letters should start going out by mid-February, the very la latest end of February, depends on how fast they get processed at that point by the university. Uh, but by mid-February, we've made decisions. And then I will say that um, even if you don't make it in the first round of awards, we, um, you know, a lot, of, I mean, we understand this is a field where people are applying to multiple programs. Pe once you get an award, you only have two weeks to make a decision on whether you keep that award. And so um, a lot of times, you know, students will get it who are on the wait list. Um, we are able to fund a, a pretty deep into our wait list sometimes. So, um, so uh, you know, throughout March, those award letters will continue to go out. Um, but the first wave will go out by the end of February, if not before. And also, Cynthia, do you want to say anything about paying deposits? Do you need should they wait before? Yeah. Do not pay your deposit um, if you are, you know, until you are until you hear about the funding award. So be in touch with us before you put down a deposit <coughs> because that um, it, it has a fact, it has it plays a role in uh, the way that the order of the letters go out. So just don't if you um, you know just hold on. Don't pay a deposit. Be in touch with us first. Okay. Can you elaborate on the international research slash study abroad opportunities that AU offers ITEP students? <laughs> Are there ways for students to obtain funding to offset costs? Sure. Do you want me to answer this? Sure. Yeah, the, I'll break it for it and then y'all chime in. I have been away for a semester, so as I've as been proven, I'm not up to date on all my facts with ITEP students. So we don't have any study abroad programs within ITEP, although we've had some. We've had one in the past that was student led and student developed. And if anyone wants to do that again, I would certainly support them in developing something like that. We have several students that have done alt breaks abroad, where they have worked with the alt break office and gone for a week to two weeks over the winter break or summer break, leading a group of students. And for costs for that, if you're a leader of an alt break. Um, I think part or all of your co travel costs are paid. Um, and then another way that students have gone abroad is that they've done research projects abroad and applied for funding through the College of Arts and Sciences. The College of Arts and Sciences has a funding competition, fellowship competition for graduate students. Um, they've submitted proposals and have gotten, it's not a lot of funding, but usually it's enough to cover a plane ticket and some lodging. But we had students in the past who have done um, been funded and done research projects in Moldova. We had a student, actually I was just telling my capstone class about this. This must have been now five or six years ago who had funding who um, went to, and did a documentary project in India. Um, we had a student just recently go to Peru and work on a sustainable development and education project with not half for international but another um, agricultural development organization. And then I've all done research projects abroad working with a faculty supervisor and receiving some funding from this competitive fellowship with the College of Arts and Sciences. And has yeah, anyone done any SIS study abroad programs? Yes, yeah, so yeah, so we have someone overseas right now on an SIS study abroad program in Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a possibility. You just have to be careful with your elective credit options because those are not courses that can count toward your core requirements. They count toward your electives. And so you have to make sure you're saving those electives and you're not using them all up early. I was going to say maybe Jody can say something about the funding that you that you distribute through the student board uh, or through the student association for funding to travel for conferences. Yes. So if your research is going to be presented at a conference, we do. I, there's a fund uh, that is decided by is is decided on by the well the graduate assistant. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because it, because it is a student organization fund, um, we ask that our students, it's theirs, it's, it's our money, it's the graduate student's money, and I simply ask that students submit their proposals and their, or an abstract, and with the help of our faculty, <laughs> we can then review it and and grant money to students um, based on what they're, what, based on whether it's a domestic or an international conference. But that funding is only if your research is going to be presented at a conference. And the College of Arts and Science, it gives out um, money for um, travel, uh, for research. That is very early in the fall semester. I think the deadline is like October 6th or something like that. So you really have to 
I think usually second year students tend to do that only because first year students don't really have a game plan yet when they, you know, the first few weeks of coming in. But and there's, I think there's still two rounds of that. There's spring and fall. So I think in the past students have done summer. I mean, we can work that out once you get here. But um, I think for the summer travel, you apply in the spring. Okay. Um, All right. I see the questions now too. Let's see. Uh, what kind of opportunities, courses, research projects? Uh, centers are there to focus on sub-Saharan Africa? So we have a couple of courses on the books. Um, so one of them we just changed to focus on the Global South instead of only on um, Africa. Uh, what used to be called ed Education Policy in Africa. We're running it now as Ed Policy in the Global South in order to bring in some more comparative dimensions. Um, and, you know, right now we don't have none of the faculty are running any research projects that are in that region. Uh, none of the faculty here. There are faculty in, uh, in, in SAS who are working in the region. Um, and of course, there's a ton of organizations downtown, I would say, that kind of thing. So um, there are other courses, um, uh, uh, particularly, again, you have you know, several, you know, 12 elective credits in SAS, a lot of courses that would focus on that region um, if you're interested in, particularly in development. Um, and right now, the only specific one that we're running is the Ed Policy in the Global South. But I would say, like you were saying, a lot right. of these courses are, since they're comparative in nature, you're going to find right. content about Sub-Saharan Africa right. Right. in the course of each the semester. Right. I'm I mean, teaching a know, course on culture that has a book on Sub-Saharan, you know, so right. there's, right, there's, there's content. It's including a lot of the top right. courses, yeah. yeah. And I would say, as a student, you get the opportunity to make your course what you want it to be. There's usually a free research paper for every course, and it has to meet some of the themes, obviously, in the course but what you choose to focus on is entirely up to you. So if you want to know everything about Sub-Saharan Africa, you can do tailor all of your courses to be about Sub-Saharan Africa. So if you're doing equity, you can do it on equity education programs in Sub-Saharan Africa. When you're taking comparative and international education and in the intro class, you can also focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, truly and honestly, I have written now maybe two or three papers on um, uh, underrepresented populations in study abroad um, because that was interesting to me when I started the program. Now I'm focusing on something else, but I mean it's entirely up to you how you choose to pursue your interests because this program gives you that flexibility. Yeah, I think that's right. We don't have, the program isn't large enough really at this time to be offering um, very specialized regional electives, and nor do I think that we, you know, I'm not even sure even if we got larger if we would go in that direction, because I think that you can get regional area studies expertise elsewhere in the university through your elective courses, um, and we're better off looking at kind of the core issues around education, identity, and culture, and cross-cultural comparison that are really um, at the heart of our expertise. But, the field, too, I yeah. think, too. Um, we do, though, of course, draw on our own research and our own experience. I mean, I used to live in, you know, I lived in Burundi for a little while. I've lived in Europe. I've lived in Eastern Europe. You've worked and lived in Mexico. I mean, so uh, Elizabeth's working in Northern Ireland and has worked in Eastern Europe, was a Peace Corps, you know, so we all have our own regional kinds of areas of expertise that we draw on, but we do try to add a lot of readings, a lot of diversity to those readings from other regions as well. I mean, just, just to add to what both Emily and Cynthia said regarding um, just making the program what it is, you will also find that even if there's an elective that is sub-Saharan Africa is somewhere in the title, you're going to find that even when you go into that class, it's going to be a class that has probably one person from every program across the university. And so in that respect or that regard, everyone there will also be bringing an additional, very different perspective to that class. So it's just the same thing. People are going to be coming at coming at subject um, areas or regional areas with very, very different perspectives in any of the classes that you go into. Yeah, and I would say that I see there's another question asking a similar thing about Western Europe. I think that's the same, goes the same for that. I mean, it gets incorporated in. I'm running a research project in, in Germany right now, so that, you know, my students are reading two chapters in progress. Um, in, uh, uh, for a book that I'm writing, they're going to read that as part of their readings this semester. So there will be a little bit, but we're also reading a book about China, we're reading a book about the Netherlands, we're reading something on um, Latin South America. So it's, you know, there's, there's a, a real mix. As an international student, I'm trying to do some financial planning beforehand. So I'm wondering if an international student does receive the highest full merit award 
how much personal funding should be should the student plan on having? Hmm. So I think we're better off probably putting you in touch with the International Students and Scholars Office on that question, Jody. But I do know, I mean, unless Jody wants to add, uh, before we mention any figures, I think, because we don't know the latest on what the, yeah. yeah, it's different, it would be different for everybody, different for the program. But you do, as a part of your visa requirement, as you know, as an international student, have to demonstrate savings that would cover the full cost of your time in the States. And so it is pretty significant. You have to have a way to demonstrate that. So if you're getting a half half award, then it's half the tuition and half of the, you know. So, um, but that really depends on uh, on what we're seeing and on what the cost of living is determined to be. But I think, Jody, you can talk about maybe really briefly how the International Students and Scholars Office will help you figure that out. Very briefly, um, <laughs> very, very briefly. Um, and just to add on what Cynthia said about your visa, Usually what happens is that they're going to require that you want, even though you do have an award, they're still going to show that you need to be able to cover your full tuition in the event that that award does not roll over because mm -hmm. they're unable to t tell whether or not that award will roll over based on your academic progress. So you'll still be able, you'll have to demonstrate that. And usually you'll have to demonstrate one and a half of that for your living expenses for the first year. So even if you're planning ahead financially just to actually move here, you should consider that you should have that money amount so that your tuition times one and a half just in order to get your visa. Wow. Okay. So that's a good place to start. We know it's crazy and that's not our, <laughs> nothing we can control. That's the U.S. State Department that comes up yeah, with Yeah, so it. it's not American universities, it's the State Department, it's the government. Yeah, and that's for everybody. Uh, on this question about deferring enrollment, we do defer enrollment. I'm just I'm rushing along because I know we have to end in, in three minutes. We do, you can defer uh, admission for one year, but there's no guarantee. Sorry, can you wave your hands? Oh, sure. <laughs> so the electronic lights. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, there's no guarantee about merit funding, so we, merit funding does not roll over, so if you're awarded a merit package and you turn it down, this happened with a student a couple of years ago, then uh, turned down the merit packet award, deferred, and then didn't get it the following year because the pool was more competitive. So, um, you know, we, we make no guarantees about how the funding works from year to year because you would just be re-entered into the pool again the following year, um, but admission can be deferred for a year. Uh, are we sending the link where we can download the whole talk to keep as a reference? I do not know the answer to that question, but Ophira might. <laughs> you know, we didn't do it last time only because um, I sat through it and listened to the whole thing again, and I thought I didn't want to put anybody through that. <laughs> <laughs> but we can. If it's recorded, we can, we'll can. we probably post it to our website. So if you're interested in it, um, be in touch with us and we can send it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so our, we have two more. Uh, we have another webinar coming up for the Master's International Program. You can RSVP through the CAS site. That is February 10th at 7 p.m. Uh, same system as this. And then we are having an in-person, in-house um, uh, grad studies day open house March 18th. Those details are not yet out. Um, they're going out sometime in February. Again, that's on the College of Arts and Science graduate page. Yeah, if you are in the area, if you happen to be passing through Washington, you're welcome to be in touch with us to come get a campus tour, to visit a class. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be on the day of the Graduate Studies Open House. We know that people have all different schedules, but we are um, trying to organize these virtually with an understanding that most of our prospective students are relocating from outside of the D.C. area, and that is the nature of our program. It's part of what makes it so great. Um, so congratulations to those of you who have already been admitted. It's been a very competitive pool so far this year. Uh, those of you who are still working on your applications, let us know if we can answer any questions. Um, we will get um, the link out to you and get it posted on our website in case you missed some of the earlier parts of it. I see some of you uh, saying that. And uh, thanks for your interest. We're really excited to see uh, who the cohort's going to be. We look forward to it every year. And um, we ha are happy to continue to answer questions. Thank you. Be in touch. Bye, everyone. Thanks, folks. Bye.